Hello and welcome to today's video, News for English Learners. Today I've chosen an article about astronomy, with the title Signs of Life on a Distant Planet. So as usual, we'll read it through together and then we'll look at some important vocabulary. Don't forget, if you want to have a copy of the text for your own uh, study, you can download it from the link in the video description below. And of course, after you've watched it, if you want to go back and just check some of the definitions and usages of the words, you can skip to the relevant word by looking for the, the timings in the video description. So let's begin with the first paragraph. In a groundbreaking development that has sent ripples of excitement through the scientific community and beyond, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope may have unearthed the first clues of extraterrestrial life on a distant exoplanet. The stunning revelation comes after the telescope's recent observation of the exoplanet known as Kepler-442b, located 1,120 light-years away from Earth. So let's begin by looking at the first word. This is groundbreaking. And we see that it comes before the noun development. So we can deduce that this is an adjective. The origin of this word is actually connected with construction, in fact. If uh, a big construction project is about to begin, sometimes they invite VIPs, very important people, to actually take part in a groundbreaking ceremony. So they actually dig the first hole to start that project. So it's that idea of something new. It's not been seen before. Um, it's almost pioneering, innovative. Uh, that is the sense that we're using here. When we say something is groundbreaking, in this case, this development, this discovery has not been seen before. And it's going to, as we say here, send ripples of excitement through the scientific community. So that brings us on to the second word here, ripples. Now, the easiest way to explain this word is to imagine. Imagine that I'm throwing a stone into a lake, a body of water. Uh, what happens when the stone hits the surface of the water? Well, as you've probably seen, if you've done this, it will create waves, essentially, and those waves will spread out over the surface of the water. This is called, or these are called, ripples in English. So ripples are essentially waves, um, and it's used figuratively here, this uh, noun, they're not obviously real ripples that you would see like on the surface of a lake, but they are figurative. They are, uh, the excitement is spreading through the scientific community. That's the sense. So it's really comparing that uh, spreading of excitement to the spreading, the dissipation of the ripples throughout the, the water when you throw stones in it. So let's move on to the third word here. We have the verb to unearth used in the present perfect tense. So this is the past participle of the regular verb. So we have a verb that essentially is the opposite of burying. So when you bury something, you dig a hole and you put an object inside the hole and then you cover it with earth. And in this sense, it's the opposite. You are unearthing. So you're actually digging something up that was buried previously. Uh, think of archaeologists. Their job essentially is to unearth artifacts or human remains, things that have been buried for centuries, maybe even thousands of years. That's what they do. And in this case, again, it's used figuratively. So they're not actually digging any holes here to find objects that have been buried. But what they have done is to discover clues of extraterrestrial life. So it's similar in that sense. When you're digging a hole as an archaeologist, you're trying to discover objects that are, have been buried. And in, as a scientist, you're trying to make new discoveries. You're trying to unearth new information or new clues. So let's move on to the fourth phrase, actually two words together here. I've put these together as the adjective stunning is modifying this noun, revelation. 
Um, let's start with the adjective. So probably the easiest way to think about this is to think of the police, because in some countries, police carry weapons. They actually carry guns habitually. However, in other countries, like where I'm from in the UK, that's not the case. Police are not allowed to habitually carry guns when they're walking in the streets. So what they have for self-defense is a thing called a stun gun. So what this does, it's a device, an electronic device that emits a very high voltage charge when it's uh, when a button is pressed. And that charge will actually stun somebody. It will shock them, gives them a very uh, high voltage electric shock. And this stops them from moving. There's, they are temporarily paralyzed, let's say. So that is one use of the verb, to stun physically when somebody becomes paralyzed. But it is also used slightly metaphorically here when we're talking about emotionally being stunned. So if I hear something extremely surprising, I might be stunned to hear that. I'm all, almost in a state of disbelief. And that is the sense here. So this revelation, and revelation is connected with the verb to reveal, almost similar to discover, the word we looked at before when we were talking about unearth. So this revelation, this discovery is stunning. It's very surprising. So let's move on to the next paragraph. Astronomers and astrobiologists have long considered this distant celestial body a prime candidate in the search for life beyond our solar system due to its similarities to our own planet. Dr. Sarah Rodriguez, a leading astrobiologist at NASA, expressed her exhilaration, saying this is a watershed moment for planetary science. The data provides us with compelling evidence of the presence of complex organic molecules in the exoplanet's atmosphere. While we must remain cautious, these molecules could be a potential indicator of biological activity. So in this paragraph, we only have two words. First one is watershed. Watershed. Now this is quite an interesting word. It is similar to another word that I've looked at in another of my videos, that word was milestone. Now, if you've seen that video, you know that a milestone is an important event in your life that is marked, uh, is remembered. And a watershed is similar in the sense that it usually refers to an important event. But it's slightly different sometimes in the sense that a watershed moment is always a time of great change. Things will never be the same after this watershed moment, um, which is not always the case with a milestone, but often it is too. So they can sometimes be used interchangeably. So the origin of watershed is actually quite interesting too. It's, uh, it's related to geology, I suppose. Rivers are formed from rainfall. And when rain falls, there is a certain area called the catchment area, uh, which is often also referred to as the watershed because that area feeds the river. So if you imagine at uh, the top of a, of a ridge, a mountain, the water that falls on this side will flow into one river, one watershed, and the water that falls on the other side here will flow into another river. That's a different watershed. So in this way, the watershed refers to a point of change. The water could flow in one direction or the other. So let's move on to the second word in this paragraph. We have the adjective cautious, cautious. So, as an adjective, this usually describes people's behavior. The opposite of cautious is reckless. So, if somebody behaves recklessly, they take risks. They do dangerous things. Think of reckless drivers. 
somebody who drives recklessly will drive too fast. They'll break the speed limit. Perhaps they will drink alcohol before they drive. They won't wear the seatbelt. All of this is reckless behavior because it puts them in danger. So as I said, cautious, to be cautious, is the opposite of that. It's somebody who avoids danger. And in this case, the article is using it to say that scientists need to remain cautious about this exciting discovery. Because although it's indicative of life, possibly, they're not sure. They still need more investigation, more evidence in order to be sure. So for this reason, it's better to be cautious, to play it safe and wait for further information. So let's move on to the next paragraph. The telescope's highly sensitive instruments detected a spectrum of organic compounds, including methane and ethane, which are often associated with living organisms on Earth. Dr. Rodriguez added, we have to exercise caution in interpreting these findings. While the detection of organic molecules is intriguing, we need to conduct further studies to rule out any abiotic processes that could produce these compounds. So the first word in this paragraph is spectrum. When I think of a spectrum, the first thing that comes to my mind is the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, in the past, I think it might have been Newton, actually, he discovered that the white light, the light that we see coming from the sun, is actually made up of different colors of light combined together. And one of the ways you can see this is if you use something called a prism, which is a piece of glass shaped more or less like a triangle. And when the light shines through that, it splits the light into a spectrum of different colors that compose it. You see the same effect when you look in the sky after rain and it's sunny and you see a rainbow. So a spectrum, therefore, is a range of different items. In this case, it's a range of different organic compounds that were detected using these highly sensitive scientific instruments. Um, the next word we have is intriguing. It says the detection of organic molecules is intriguing. So if we think of intrigue, that's a noun and a verb. Intriguing, on the other hand, is the adjective. Then what we're thinking about here is an element of mystery. So if there is mystery, if we, if we don't know why something is happening, then quite often we are curious to find out why that is. So we would say that that situation is intriguing. We want to investigate it further. We want to find out the origin of this issue, of this problem. So the third word we have here is actually a phrasal verb. It's rule out. Uh, this is a separable phrasal verb. So we can put an object between the verb and the particle. Somebody can be ruled out or something can be ruled out. And essentially, that means that that person is not included or discarded in some way, or perhaps some, some action in a similar way can also be deemed to be impossible. Something that's definitely not going to happen would be ruled out. So sometimes, for example, um, a person can be ruled out if they are not able to participate in something. Think of a footballer. Perhaps they've been ruled out of playing in the next match because of injury. Perhaps they have some problem that makes it impossible for them to play. Also, perhaps the government might rule out increasing taxes just before an election because they know that that would be highly unpopular with the population. So they say that that's not going to happen. It's impossible. Another way of saying that would be it's out of the question. So let's move on to the next paragraph. 
In the words of Dr. Michael Turner, an astrophysicist and professor at the University of California, this discovery is like finding a needle in a cosmic haystack. As researchers continue to look into the data from the James Webb Space Telescope, the world watches with bated breath, hopeful that we may soon answer the age-old question, are we alone in the universe? So firstly, we're going to look at this whole phrase here, which I've highlighted. The reason I've highlighted this together is because it is actually an idiomatic phrase that is very, very common in English. When you're describing a task that is extremely tedious and time-consuming, and in fact, perhaps even impossible to achieve, we say it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Hay is basically the organic material, the plant matter, that is used by farmers in some countries to feed their animals during the winter season. And usually this dried grass is stacked. That means it's piled on top of each other in big uh, blocks and stored in a room. So a haystack is a lot of grass all piled up together. So, and a needle, on the other hand, is something we use for sewing. It's a long, thin piece of metal that's very sharp, and you can use it to sew material, to repair material with a thread. So if you imagine trying to find a, a thin needle in a massive stack of hay, dried grass, obviously that would be a very, very difficult, if not impossible task. So that is why we use this comparison here whenever we're talking about a task that is extremely difficult. Um, and in this case, the task was the discovery of this planet. It's saying that in the cosmic context, in the universal context, it, it was extremely difficult to find. So let's look at the second word here. We have another phrasal verb, look into. So you look into something when you are basically investigating or researching it. Uh, this is a non-separable phrasal verb, so the object always goes after into. So researchers can look into a cure for a particular disease, medical researchers. The police can look into a crime that means they're investigating it, trying to find who was responsible for the crime by finding clues. And in this case, the researchers are looking into the data from the telescope. So they are continuing to research that data and to look for further clues. Let's move on to the last word. Two words together again, bated breath. I uh, put these two together because they are often found together. Uh, when you wait for something with bated breath, it means that you are very excited, but also perhaps nervous of what the outcome might be. Um, breath refers to the air that you take into your body when you breathe. Breathe actually has an E on the end. Uh, without the E, it's pronounced breath. And basically, when we are very nervous and excited, we tend to hold our breath. We kind of stop breathing temporarily. So this word, baited, is actually the same concept here, is to hold your breath. It comes originally from uh, the verb to abate. To abate originally meant to stop or diminish something that was harmful. Um, we still sometimes use the verb when we're talking about a storm abating, although quite often we would use the phrasal verb die down. So if the storm diminishes, we would say it's abated. And But this is the most common way you would see the adjective form used. So you're waiting or watching something with bated breath. The scientists are very excited, but also quite nervous. And But they are hopeful that we may soon answer this important question. So there we have it. That's the end of today's video. Thank you very much for listening and watching. 
and I hope you've learned something and I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please like the video and subscribe to get notifications of the next videos. Uh, thank you very much and see you next time.